Hello, 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 and welcome once again to Movies That Pop. I'm the Colonel. Let's see what popped up in theaters this week. The Magnificent Seven is a solid, enjoyable western that brings the action and stays fun throughout. While it may suffer some minor pacing issues, causing it to be a shade too long, this is one remake that never makes you question its reason for existence. All you gotta do is sit back and enjoy it. Tell you what, call up your dad. Call up your dad and take him to see The Magnificent Seven this weekend. Go on, he probably misses you. And you know what? You'll probably have a great time bonding while dodging all the bullets. That's it for the capsule review. Let's get in depth. That's right, The Magnificent Seven is a remake of the 1960 John Sturgis Western, which was itself a retelling of the 1954 Kurosawa film, The Seven Samurai, which inspired not only The Magnificent Seven, but Three Amigos, which begat Galaxy Quest and... Uh, you know what? I could do this all day. The point is, the story of The Magnificent Seven really isn't all that original. In fact, just about every Western, including and up to Clint Eastwood's Oscar-winning Unforgiven, relies on the trope of a small town being bullied and asking an outsider, or team of outsiders in this case, to come in and take out the trash. Here, the unconscionable baddie is a real piece of work named Bartholomew Bogue, and he's played with slimy grandeur by Peter Sarsgaard. Now, when your primary antagonist appears in the film's opening scene, then disappears for the majority of the rest of the film, he's got to be hateable in that opening scene. You've got to hate him so much that your hatred carries you through the next hour of screen time while the team is being assembled and is planning the rescue of the town. You simply cannot forget, even for a moment, just how purely evil their adversary is. And Sarsgaard absolutely nails it. In one well-executed opening scene, he barges into the church in the town of Rose Creek with armed men who casually just spit their brown loogies on the floor of the church, threatens a child, belittles the entire town, murders a few people, and then burns down the church for good measure. He then orders the sheriff to leave the dead bodies where they lay for at least a few days so that everyone in town gets the message. Now, before we've even seen the title card, we are already ready for this dude to die. I mean, baby, we want him to die, die, die. Well, somebody please just shoot this guy. Before long, Sam Chisholm, a bounty hunter played by Denzel Washington, is hired to assemble a squad to take back the town. So we assemble the team, including the gambler, the legendary sharpshooter, the tracker, the assassin, the outlaw, and the Comanche warrior. That's right. Let's hear it for diversity. It works for you and it works for me. Let's all cheer one, two, three. Cheers for diversity! <coughs> Sorry about that. Anyway, in addition to a couple of plain old white guys, we do get a refreshing, for a Western anyway, assemblage of minorities. Only one of each, but still, you know, very cool. And each of them has at least one cool bit of business or character moment, unlike other recent ensemble films like <coughs> Suicide Squad! <coughs> Excuse me, I <coughs> had a little cough there. Now, even though Chris Pratt is arguably the biggest star in the supporting cast, he seems content to be just one of the ensemble here. And while his sleight of hand loving gunslinger is fun, I found myself appreciating the bits with Ethan Hawke's haunted goodnight character and every single little morsel given to the legendary Vincent D'Onofrio as the big bear Jack Horn. The Magnificent Seven is even handed in its characterization, sure footed in its direction by Antoine Fuqua, the director of Training Day. But you know what else this movie is? Fun! Lots of gunslinging, rootin' tootin' fun. The action scenes here have weight and momentum and are well staged all around. The script is written by Richard Wank and Nick Pizzolatto, and if that last name is familiar, it's because he created and wrote every episode of True Detective. This guy knows how to imbue his characters with soul, even the despicable ones. There is also some terrific cinematography, which creates a nice sense of place, and a thrilling action movie score. So thrilling, dare I say iconic, that it creates quite a legacy for the late James Horner, who had begun writing the score before his tragic death last year in a plane crash. It was later finished by his longtime collaborator, Simon Franklin, and it's a fitting denouement for Horner's legendary career. The only gripe I'd have with The Magnificent Seven is that it's a bit too long. This simple revenge story bloats to two hours and 15 minutes, and there are only two action set pieces in the entire film. While they are both great, the time between them does seem a little prolonged, and I found myself getting anxious while waiting for the final showdown. However, once that showdown ensues, The Magnificent Seven does not disappoint. Guns are slung, arrows fly, and remember that guy you hated so much in the very beginning? Who boy, hold on to your hat, cause it's on like Donkey Kong! Large bag of popcorn for The Magnificent Seven. It's a story that you definitely have seen before, but here it's being told by a top tier cast and creative team operating at the very height of their abilities. That does it for this edition of Movies That Pop. Don't forget to follow me, the Colonel, on Twitter, at Movies That Pop. Click the icon right down there to visit our channel if you'd like to see more, and support us by clicking subscribe while you're there, and by clicking the thumbs up icon below. I'd like to hear your thoughts on The Magnificent Seven in the comments as well. Let's talk about it. In the meantime, thanks for watching. I'm the Colonel. Now go on now. Get it.